Hello, it's Terry Dennery of the MathWorks. So in our last video, we talked about controlling voltage and specifically we talked about a method called pulse width modulation, right? And um, I want to correct something that I said in that one, which was that, you know, that this video, this, this interest in controlling voltage was motivated by what we saw in our previous video, where we saw a very elegant method for you know, essentially moving the robot, a control method using feed forward methods. Okay, and um, here's the correction, right? In, the, in our video last week, what it really was about was applying pulse width modulation to achieve the velocity of a motor that we wanted, okay? And um, what we saw in our control uh, application was it's the, the key to doing it was really the ability to control torque. Okay, and uh, there's no question pulse width modulation is a means to control torque as well, but it's a little bit more complicated to explain that. And so anyways, what we're going to do in this video is a little bit more voltage control, but we're going to use a method that um, is beautiful from the simplicity it offers, uh, but it actually is a pretty effective method also, but it's also one that it's more clearly um, possible to explain how torque can be controlled as well. All right? And so the method uh, quite often is called hysteresis uh, voltage control. It also goes by the name bang bang, which and I, I kind of like that name. So the idea for this video really occurred to me about a week ago. All right? And I was interested in learning a little bit more about how you know, these, these AC drives work. And so I went to uh, the Simscape Power Systems library that has some really good you know, drives, right? And so I took this one right here, the brushless, you know, DC motor drive. Okay, and I think it's really interesting, you know, that the brushless DC motor drive actually resides in the AC drives library. Okay, and we'll talk about that a little bit, all right? But clearly it is an AC drive because it's got three electrical terminals, A, B, and C, um, for the three-phase kind of voltage power supply that we would connect to this. Right, so let's um, take a look at this. So we'll look under the mask. All right, and I'll begin. You know, and what we're really looking at is you know the kind of the more detailed description of a, an AC drive by justifying just a little bit why it's called a DC drive. <clears throat> and then you'll see one of the first things that occurs is that three-phase AC source gets rectified to create you know a DC uh, supply right there. So that DC uh, then gets presented to an inverter, all right, that ultimately puts the voltages that we want on the A, B, and C pins of a permanent magnet synchronous motor. Okay, and all this really takes place because of controls. And so in this example, we have essentially a set point for motion coming in uh, that gets compared to a measurement on the motion, in this case it's speed, and that uh, essentially this thing will figure out a torque required to essentially close the gap between where we are and where we want to be. All right? And then it's with this torque being calculated that we're able to get into uh, a current controller and it's through control of current that we're able to get the torques that we want. All right? And that it all comes down to our ability to calculate kind of an ideal um, expression of what current should be for the torque that we want and to compare it with what we currently have on current. All right? and so for each of those circuits, the A, B, and C circuits, we'll see a plus minus occur between what we want and what we have to calculate an error and that that error then is presented to this very interesting little block which is called a relay. So the relay block right there resides in the discontinuities library which is a part of the base simulink package, right? And so let's build a quick model where we'll kind of explore how this works, right? And so I got my relay. I'm going to source it with a sine function, all right? And so then let's get some uh, scope. And I'll put two ports on my scope. Uh, one will receive the value of uh, output by the relay and the other one will take our base signal, the sine function that's going to drive the behavior of this. All right, okay, let's hit run. Okay, and so very quickly, you know, we'll kind of see that the relay is essentially giving me kind of, I'll call it a binary signal. You know, it's going to be a zero or a one, all right? And it's all triggered based on what's happening, you know, with our sine function. So let's explore that. 
Okay, and so the parameterization of a relay is there is a switch on point, okay, and that's essentially where you go from zero to one, and then a switch off point where you go from one back down to zero. Right? And so I'm going to put in some values that are like right in the middle of the amplitude of that sine function. So I'll put 0 0.5 for an on, and let's make it minus 0 0.5 for an off. Okay, and so we'll hit run. Okay, and we'll see how that's working. That the blue line, the you know, sine function, hits that 0 0.5 value. That's when the relay now triggers. It goes from 0 to 1, or you might say from off to on. Okay, and so when it comes back to 0 0.5, you know, nothing happens. Well, that's because it's in an on state, and the only way to get out of an on state is to actually hit your switch off point, which you, we see we defined at minus 0 0.5, and it's when the sine function hits that value, that's when we see it return from 1 to 0. Okay, so now we're going to place our relays into a uh, control algorithm for controlling uh, a DC motor, right? And so our DC motor is set up so that voltage can be an input, um, and then outputs are available on current, position, and torque. Now with regard to torque, you're gonna see that that's one that's being fed back, right? And that the, fe the feedback of torque is gonna be compared to a command signal, which is ultimately our desired torque, right? And that the difference between the two will essentially create an error. Right? And it's here that we really see the role of the relay is to es essentially establish tolerances on how much error we really allowed to have. Okay? And if our error is less than what we define as a switch on point, which I'm calling acceptable drift, then uh, it's going to return zero and it's just going to say keep things going the way they are. Okay? But once we exceed that acceptable drift, then an action does take place. The relay does all of a sudden emit a 1 instead of a 0 and we'll see in the way that we set up the multiplication here that a 1 will deliver what is essentially a DC voltage source of 10 volts to our DC motor. And I, I hope it's clear you know, the, that w with regard to connecting our voltage source to the DC motor, we can set up an alternate circuit which will essentially reverse the polarity and enable us to take that same 10 volt DC source and deliver it to the motor as minus 10, right? And because we do want to have a range of plus 10 to minus 10, we set up an, an additional relay which will kind of handle the negative direction. So uh, let's hit the run button. All right, and so we're going to look at the delivered torque compared to the commanded torque. You know, and right off the bat, things do look pretty good. You know, I know that the delivered torque is the yellow line and that the commanded torque is the blue line. All right, so let's kind of zoom in here. All right, and what we're seeing really is kind of exactly what I was talking about. All right, that, that we have defined a tolerance of acceptable error, right? And that once we begin to exceed that, tolerance that we've set in our relay block is a switch on point that the relay says let's take some action and it delivers a one and all suddenly we're applying additional voltage or different voltage let's put it that way because it could be both positive or negative voltage but we're applying voltage that will restore things to be a little bit closer to what's being commanded by our torque command right and that you know what this comes down to is what's an acceptable quality level for what's being delivered as torque compared to our nominal value. And it has a lot to do with how we set these tolerances. So we'll see the acceptable drift, you know, defined right here in my MATLAB workspace, um, is at 0 0.01 so far. I'm going to double click on this and now set it to 1 times 10 to the minus 3. Right, and we'll hit the run button and we'll use the Simulink Data Inspector to kind of compare um, how this run um, differs from, from what we saw in the previous one. All right, and so I'm going to look at torque, torque command from the previous run, and then let's look at torque uh, from the run we just did. All right, so orange is the most recent run, green is the previous one. Okay, and so it's clear that that tightening of the tolerance, 
through the you know acceptable drift has really reduced the oscillation quite a bit right and that the cost of that I don't know if I can do it like this. Maybe I'll just zoom in on here a little bit and we'll focus on the new one. Is a much higher frequency, all right? That the switching is just going on and off much, much more rapidly. And so what I'd like to do is, uh, well, let's zoom in just a little bit more, all right? And now I think I'll use this guy right here. And let's look at a range of about one millisecond. Right, and we're going to see that you know, essentially a switch is probably taking place, you know, maybe whatever, you know, two ten thousandths of a second before our window starts here. But let's say one, two, three, four, probably about five switches are taking place in that one one thousandth of a second. Right, and so what that means is that we're switching at least at this point in the the trajectory at about five thousand hertz. Okay, so let's finish up on what I'll call an implementation issue, all right? And the point is that all this math that's kind of in between my command signal and my DC motor is going to take place on an embedded processor. Now that processor will have a normal clock cycle, all right? And, and so what we've done is we've introduced these blocks here, rate transition blocks, which give us the ability to define a sample time. All right, and the, the TS, and I've, I've uh, set its value to be 1 times 10 to the minus 5th. All right, that means that it's operating at about 100,000 hertz, which appears to be a pretty good ratio with regard to the rate at which the relay operates, which was 5,000 hertz, of 20 to 1. Okay, so anyways, let's take a look at the results. All right, and so the orange is, I'll call the idealized you know, perfect time to throw the switch, you know, when that tolerance of, I'll call it inaccuracy on torque, gets violated and that switch gets thrown to, to kind of correct the situation. Well, the green one, which is constrained by a sample time, you know, is potentially uh, going to have to wait a little bit because it's going to have to wait till that next point in time where that processor has the ability to throw a switch. And when it does have to wait, and, you know, this might be a good point to look at it, let's zoom in like right here, you know, that it, it will, you know, uh, overshoot just a little bit further because it hasn't had the opportunity to throw that switch at that perfect point in time. But because we are operating at such a, a high rate, you, know, you can see for the most part that this looks really quite good, you know. Um, so the last thing we're going to do is set our sample time to 10 to the minus fourth. And let's run the simulation. Okay, so let's compare this simulation with the pure uh, relay method, you know, which again shows up in orange and we see this nice tight band of orange uh, showing the torque that's delivered and the amplitude of oscillation beyond the nominal value. Okay, and so now we're operating on in a, a, a processor, let's say, that's, that's um, running at 10,000 hertz. So our ratio is only now 2 to 1. Okay, and what we're finding is we're getting a uh, much more uh, excessive overshoot, okay, which really has to do with, uh, you know, that we're waiting too long to throw the switch to correct the issue when we're seeing that our tolerances are being violated. Okay, all right, and, you know, whether or not this is good or not, good enough or not, that's a bit of a judgment call. You know, and that you guys will make these decisions based on, you know, you know, what the system is and what the requirements of performance are, you know, for that system, okay? But it's an important judgment to get right because what it's really implying is that if it's not good enough, you do need to increase your sample rate, which might mean a change of hardware for your processor to something maybe a little bit more expensive, um, maybe something that will be new to your development organization, therefore uh, will increase the complexity of your development process. Okay, you might need to switch to an FPGA, all right? And FPGAs are amazing things. You can probably run them at like 10 million hertz, but you'll need to program them with HDL and Verilog, and, and again, you might really increase the complexity of your development process. Oh yes, one more thing. Uh, let's show the output of the relay. Uh, so I'll introduce this graph, and I'm calling that signal positive um, voltage MOSFET. But anyways, I just want you to look at these square pulses, which, you know, 
um, with some familiarity of pulse width modulation, which we saw last time, we should see something that's looking very, very familiar, right? And that ultimately these uh, hysteresis and bang bang methods are very similar, similar to pulse width modulation. Okay, so this was a really interesting video for me personally, and so I, I think it's really cool how I'm beginning to see the connection with the software development teams, you know, with regard to what we're really trying to do with these electromechanical systems and, and the impact that it has on, on choices of like processor and whether you even use an FPGA or not. You know, that that's, that's quite interesting and it's, again, kind of including more of the really important people into the team and that, that we have a platform that really kind of facilitates um, their, their needs as well. Okay, but probably the really most important part for me is the idea of torque control, okay? And certainly we could look at my, my block diagram, my controller, and I happen to choose feedback on torque. Could have chosen feedback on position, velocity, whatever, right? But, but torque's an important thing, right? And we know, you know, if I apply voltage, it's going to have a positive impact on maybe my position velocity as well as torque, okay? But when you choose to do it on something like position, you're kind of waving your hands and allowing the mechanism of how voltage gets converted to current, current gets converted to torque, torque gets con converted to acceleration, velocity, and position to take place without your thought, okay? And then this was what was real interesting to me about our feed forward control um, video, you know, uh, a few videos back, as it allows you to participate, you know, in how those position velocities and accelerations are going to take place because you're operating at that core level, torque, you know, and that there is a directionality. Torque gets integrated, or torque translates to acceleration, acceleration gets integrated to velocity, and velocity gets integrated to position, okay? And, um, and that it allows more of your insight and more of your design to participate in to the way the, the overall system's going to work. So anyways, hopefully not too philosophical on this point, but I, I ultimately I think a really important aspect of controlling at a torque level. We continue to place all files that we're using in these videos on the file exchange of Mat MATLAB Central, so please try it out. As always, uh, thank you very much for watching this video. Um, if you liked it, please hit that like button and, um, you know, feel free to contact us. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much. This is Terry. Okay, bye.